So, I think you know, the very first time uh, a man managed to control uh, the nuclear fission chain reaction was in 1942. And it's impressive because um, the discovery of fission was only a few years before, and at that time, humanity already had all the physics, all the knowledge to master how to keep neutrons, which are really tiny particles, to move in a, in a medium, break, split, fissile nuclei, to get more nu nu neutrons to keep a chain reaction sustainable. And the CP1, the famous uh, reactor conceived, designed, and built under the supervision of the Rito Fermi, so Italy, of course, we are proud of this, uh, was made in Chicago. It was built in one month, and early in December, for the first time, it demonstrated that, yes, nuclear power can be a reality. So really, in a few years, all the theory was developed, and thanks to this reactor, demonstrated. <coughs> it's, I would like also to stress that already at that time, there was only theory in their hands, but they already implemented in this reactor diverse safety systems. So they already put themselves the question how to keep it safe, and to be sure, they not use just one system, but more. Three was were implemented in CP1 already. But it was really a toy. So if you want to make a step further, it's a few years later. Uh, the EDR1 plant in the United States, again, at the Guam National Laboratory, close to, to Chicago, was built in three years, and in 50, uh, August 51 started operation. And this reactor proved for the first time that it was possible to get and use power. The first time they just lighted four light bulbs, 20, uh, 200 watt each, but really in a short time they managed to produce enough electricity to power the whole building, and it was 200 kilowatt. It was a system quite different from the first one, so they needed to include uh, all the heat removal system, they use the uh, tactic of uh, sodium and potassium. And another great achievement of this system was that they demonstrated the possibility to breathe new fuel. So in the sense, it's not just picking from uh, uh, nature, the resources, the energy source that was mentioned in the first presentation, but also the possibility to create a new one. And I would like to keep, uh, for you to keep this point in mind. So, okay, let's start a little bit. Approaching the topic, you've seen already this one. Uh, it's nice because the three of us, we show the same picture, but with different picture. They, are, they come all from the same source, which is the Generation 4 International Forum website. It's an interesting uh, source of information if you want. You can just Google it. <clears throat> so you heard that the generation one were really prototypes to demonstrate at industrial scale the possibility to produce significant amount of energy. The generation two are uh, embraces, I would like to say, <coughs> most of the plants that are running today. And here in these years, we are in the process of implementing the generation three and possibly the generation 3 plus reactors, which are slight uh, modifications to each other, but these are the state of the art today. But to make a step forward, um, I would like to make a link with the first presentation, and I found very interesting the definition of sustainability that the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, developed. It, it, and not just with, uh, around nuclear, it's sustainability in general. So, what they started considering is that if you think something sustainable is not just environmental friendly, which is 
often the shortcut that you hear when you hear people and politicians maybe think about sustainability. It has to be green. It's not really only that part. There is also the social aspect that need to be taken into account deeply and the economic part. And if you lack one of the three, you are not really sustainable. And it's quite easy to understand because if you think something that is economic but is not social, of course, that is against society, it, is, it doesn't respond to the needs that the society puts forward, as for in the first presentation, that's something that is not acceptable. If it's social but it's not green, or again, if it's green but it's not social, it cannot be bared by the population. And if it's, yeah, very green, but really expensive, eventually it will impair the possibility to, get, to be developed, and it will have an impact also on the social aspects. So, if you think a little bit, I, I will not stress that much, but all the presentations will be available. If, so if you want to elaborate and think more on this, you will find everything. If you think of the environment, uh, the indicators, the attributes that have been uh, identified are mostly related to the atmosphere, the protection of the atmosphere, which means to reduce the greenhouse gases emissions, but also the pollutants in emissions and concentrations, which was the dirty air that was mentioned before. It's also protecting the water systems, reducing the discharges of contaminants, and to keep a, a careful eye on the protection and use of the soil, of the land. Not only acidified areas, deforestation, but also related to the waste, either uh, conventional or radioactive. Uh, radio. If you move to the social attributes, the first one has to be accessibility. It was told before, there is really a lot of people. We are used to think about Western countries, Italy in particular, we are here, or our neighbors. But if you think at the world, globally, there is really a huge percentage, a percentage of people that has no access to electricity or energy in general. And that's really dramatic. That's something we must be responsible for. But also, it cannot be acceptable to make electricity not affordable. Yes, electricity, energy. Yes, we give you energy, but this energy will have a significant impact on, the, on your income. So to get energy, you have to renounce to anything else. Food or living, or even welfare. I mean, having your children going to play soccer, no, because they need to wash, the, uh, wash their dishes, or wash their clothes, or give them electricity to study in the night. That's unacceptable. And, of course, the point of safety. But, as you heard, safety I, I hope at least we will we'll pass the message that safety from the very beginning is a background that is in, in the mind of the nuclear engineers. For the economic attributes, uh, well, the first point is of course efficiency. You probably would expect the price to be the first one, but well, we are talking more or less the same. There is another point that is a little bit less obvious, is the security. It makes a great difference if you need energy, you click on, you click so hoping to have energy coming and it does not come. So the security of energy is crucial. Of course, this is not a problem that a single person should, uh, should deal with. Uh, it should be considered at national level. And in fact, all countries have stocks of uh, energy uh, or fuels of sources that are kept there to be to be sure that in case of need they can power the country. But of course, if you need 
sail to, call, to foresee, anticipate, and uh, avoid one week of blackout. And for that one week of blackout, you need tons and tons of something, or drums, or something else. It makes a difference. So, <coughs> keeping all these things in mind, one can try to have an idea of what is the identity of nuclear with regard to sustainability under these three attributes. And the first point is that, well, it doesn't rely on combustion, so there is no emission during operation of greenhouse gases nor pollutants at all. There is no impact on land acidification, deforestation, and so on. There is a high energy concentration. It was mentioned already. And it's a key point. You really see how many things are impacted. The color code is just uh, green was environment, red was economic, so on. So you, have, you can see how many things are impacted by the high energy concentration of nuclear. A lot of advantages. It has a low cost. It is in fact proven that all the generation 2 plants which are running area and on which we have uh, some operating experience are really low cost. So they can provide affordable energy, cheap energy, and reliable. Reliable Reliability is here, and you see again how many impacts. And last, but definitely not least, power plants are safe. Now this is the point of view of someone working in the field. But I know perfectly there are two main points that are pointed out from people not aware and uh, criticizing nuclear, and are indeed safety and the point of waste. So on these two, I would like to give you just a few hunt, uh, hints. And the point is, per plant or per person to which the energy retrieved from that plant has been delivered, you can count on the amount of uh, waste that is produced. There is, well, a significant amount, but this, this is not just industrial. I mean, the concrete, you destroy the building, you have concrete. It's just concrete. You can dispose of very easily. You can account it, and it's one billion cubic meters per plant, something like this. There are uh, toxic industrial, in the sense they are not as easy to manage as concrete, they are still standard waste, and they are much less. The radiative part is only this one, and there is, it's also divided into radiative, easily radiative. The ones of you that have been yesterday visiting the Kursko plant, uh, you got uh, wares, uh, covers for your uh, shoes, uh, gloves, everything you used was thrown away. And since you were inside the nuclear power plant, by law, it has to be treated as radioactive waste. But you have been touching it, you have been wearing it, indeed. So it's really not radioactive. When you exited the, the power plant, the controlled area, you had your controls. It has a very, 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 very low radioactivity. It makes no harm, but it's still considered as radioactive. The highly radioactive, the one we really have to take a, a careful look at disposing is the spent fuel in it. But this is really negligible if you compare with the, comp with the overall waste that is generated. So how we deal with the highly radioactive waste? We have two ways. This is a, a few rock where the source of radioactivity is uh, contained, you can either keep it like this into the fuel assemblies, pick all the fuel assemblies, put them into first sealed cask, which is then blocked into uh, concrete reinforced structures, which are placed very far underground. The other way around is to pick up this part, to put in a reprocessing plant, where, I will come to this later, you can separate and isolate the radioactive waste, put them into a glass matrix, so every time 
part is uh, vitrified, and eventually we get small casks like this, which are put into again another cask, into the concrete part, and underground. So you see also how many barriers are between the radioactivity and the environment here. And concerning safety, well, there could be a lot of arguments to, to put forward. But eventually, I think the most, uh, the, the, the last number is that if you have a look at the global production of energy and you look at that, at that, uh, that rate associated, you can see nuclear is scoring the best. Here the hypothesis is, if all the nuclear, uh, if all energy were to be produced by each of these sources. I'm sorry, uh, 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 I, I had no time to translate, so it's in time. But I think you can understand, it's coal, oil, gas, biofuels, uh, solar, uh, wind, hydro, and nuclear. And it's impressive, and people often doesn't think the solar with such a high impact. Uh, and if you think that massive deploying uh, photovoltaic panels, the deadly rate of people going on the, on the roofs to install that is much, much, much higher than the all that role from the accidents we had in the past. In the year. But still, I know perfectly that this is not enough. People still continue asking. And in fact, the concept behind the generation four, as I mentioned, uh, really uh, right before me, is to point on this new uh, key feature for generation four systems. And among these systems, I will concentrate here in the following on the lead fast reactor, just because of the tradition we have in Italy on this technology. So the key difference is when, when we think of the present generation reactors, which are based on uh, water-cooled systems and the generation for lead cooled systems is that in the present generation reactors we use uh, mostly slow neutrons. In the, instead here we use fast neutrons. This is the F here. And again, well, yes, water to cool, which must be under in pressure, and molten lead, which is instead of atmospheric pressure. These are the two main differences. So, what we hope to get here is to have safe to become innovative. So, it will not be through engineered provision that you add to the plant, but it will be the spontaneous reaction of the plant to keep it in a safe condition, to never go into a, a, an accident, a core degradation. And, although here the waste was already low because of the high energy concentration, to get minimum waste, to go to the lowest amount possible. So concerning the, the, the fuel, uh, it, mm, this was a question more or less related to what was asked uh, by the professor here who left, uh, I'm afraid. So what you do now with thermal reactors in general, you pick uranium from the ore, it has some enrichment, some content of useful isotopes in it, but the content is not sufficient for the present reactors to sustain the chain reaction. So what you do is to enrich. So you pick eight tons and a half, more or less, from the ore to get one ton of enriched fuel. Unfortunately, the 7.5 tons that are left unused are there. We have no idea what to do with them. They are not waste, they just come from the ore. But they are there, we are not using it. And this ton enters the power station and eventually gets out a spent fuel. So I showed you one of the ways to dispose of it is to put it directly into the geological disposal. But in this fuel, with the present technology, we cannot get more than about 1% of the energy potential that is in the 8.5 tons that we got from the mine. 
So having a look at what is inside this span tube, we have a lot of uranium. The fissile one, the one that was important is here, and it's less than 1%. To use it, you had to bring this concentration to 4.5%, more or less. You get the fission products, which is the real dust of the fission, the two fragments that are created when you break the nuclear. You have plutonium, and you have some minor actinides, which means if you start from uranium and you get capture, if you look at the periodic table of elements, you create new elements, the following one, each time you capture a, 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 a neutron. So you get not only plutonium, which is the closest one, but you get also some minor ones which are farther in the chain. Well, plutonium has a potential as fuel, just like the uranium-35. The uranium-38 is what remains after enrichment, the 7.5 tons, mostly. The fission products are dust and they have to be disposed of. And the minor actinides presently are, again, waste. So what can we do better with fast reactors in general? No matter if they are lead, sodium, or gas food, if they use fast neutrons, you have a chance. You can just pick the spent fuel and instead of bringing it to the waste disposal, you move it here, to a reprocessing plant, where you extract plutonium and you recover it. And if you recover also from the stock of depleted uranium, you have to leave behind during the rich tank some uranium as well. You mix up and make new fuel for these new reactors. And if you think that this can go indefinitely at this point, because the spent fuel of, the, of a fast reactor itself can be reprocessed and recovered, the only part that goes there is this small amount of fission pro uh, products. So if we compare the, few, the resources utilization and the final waste that is produced, you see that now we use almost 100% of the energy potential, but not only from the mine, we can also recover from the huge stocks that are accumulated worldwide of depleted uranium, which now is worth to be used. And the reduction in the waste generation is close to 1 over 200. So, 1 170th of the previous waste is now generated. And by doing so, another good point is that before the spent fuel reaches the same radiotoxicity as the nature of uranium you get in the ore, which is in a way um, how to say, okay, the extra radioactivity that we generated in the world, in the system, that brought this point from here to here, goes down as we did nothing. Well, if you don't reprocess, so you pick all the spent fuel and put it in uh, underground, it takes 200, uh, 220,000 years, quite a long time. Uh, sometimes you see here 300,000, 100,000, 1 million. By the way, a long time. <coughs> Instead, if you separate and reprocess and you spend, uh, send to the repository only the, the efficient products, then you can shorten this period to 230 years. So after 230 years, which is something, well, not myself, but my generation of uh, children and uh, grandchildren and so on and so forth, will manage, can manage, at that point, what now is called waste will not be different from the uranium in the mine. Something natural in, in relativity. <coughs> so, what are we doing for this? We started in the 90s, more or less, with some uh, pioneering facility that was built at Frasinone. Uh, my colleague Mariano here uh, has been uh, responsible for the, all these facilities for eight years or almost. Uh, these are just the first two. Now there are uh, the, the tenth one, I think, is under commissioning. Uh, so we'll start soon. And we started addressing how to use molten lead as a coolant in a nuclear power plant. 
concepts, with all the aspects that are related and associated. So all the technology that comes from it. It was mentioned before at the TRL, the technology readiness level. Well, it's quite a technical definition, so, so I will want to stress you with this. I just want to give you the, the hint that from the moment you get a brilliant idea to the moment it gets to the market, there are classified nine steps you have to do to advance the readiness of this technology. The idea is just a sign on the paper, and the market is something that pretends quality from the product. So in between you have a lot of steps in which you start observing the, the principles, formulating the technology, proving it, validating it in lab before and then in an environment which is relevant and representative of the final system and so on and so forth. Up to getting a system that is really proven in operational environment. And from that point you can go to the market. So in 20 years, uh, we practically took something that was at this point, and now, of course, a nuclear system, uh, a nuclear reactor is made of hundreds of systems, and each system is made of components and these different parts. So, for all of them, we have addressed research and development activities, and we are moving in this range. So for some of them, we are still ranging in the tier of 3. For some of them, we are very close to the tier of 7. But at this point, we are moving, addressing each aspect one by one. So the real changing point will be to get the demonstration of the whole system at tier of 6 by realizing a nuclear reactor, a demonstrator reactor. And this is what we're working for. Of course, it cannot be just Italy. Collaboration is really, indeed, a main point. And for this, there is a broad collaboration in Europe around the lead fast reactor. Yeah. And what we are trying to do, to do is to build a demonstrator that will permit us to step the last levels of the tier chain to a commercial generation for a system, or even sooner, to a commercial system complying still with generation for objectives, but a small modular type that could come earlier than the large plan. Uh, okay, the video is just promotion. Uh, I'm running out of time, so again, Italy is playing a uh, good job and a great role in this international consortium pushing for, uh, uh, for this reactor. Romania by 2030, uh, the latest, with all the remaining activities that have to be done. And, okay, that's it. Of course, if you have questions, technical questions or curiosities, I will be glad to answer.